Um, I'm, uh, my name is Floris. Uh, I've been writing Python for quite a while, and uh, uh, I've been uh, starting to use uh, Kubernetes um, for, for about one and a half years, I think. Um, I, I've worked with it um, since, since just before it became 1.0. Uh, and this is sort of uh, a, a, a number of things that can, can make your life um, easier towards uh, b building your application more, more, um, more, more suitable for Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, that's kind of where the, the title Cloud Native Python comes from. Uh, and one of the things is like uh, it's it's not really necessary to do all of those things. You can you can start without actually doing any of these things. As soon as you got, you can uh, Dockerize your, your application. You you can run it. You can run it in Kubernetes and start benefiting. Uh, it, it's just a number of things you can start adding to, uh, to to your application gradually as you need them, as you want them, uh, kind of thing. Um, I'll, this is sort of um, the, the 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 roadmap. So I'll go um, I'll go through uh, v very quickly. Give a a, a bit of a background about how Kubernetes actually works. Uh, if you if you know what Kubernetes already, that, that's uh, maybe may a, a repetition. But I'll I'll keep it very um, small and simple. Then I'll sort of say on on which parts of the execution environment that you get out out of um, when you're running inside Kubernetes that you can sort of rely on what 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 uh, shortcuts you can use. Um, I'll talk about uh, uh, ha handling logging, uh, and then, and then I'll go a bit about um, endpoints and uh, monitoring. So this is kind of my summary of Kubernetes, kind of. Um, so Kubernetes inside of in, in, in one slide, uh, if you want. Uh, so Kubernetes is actually it, it's it's an orchestrator for for uh, running your, your your application on on a cluster. So the idea is that you you just have your your process which um, you wrap into a container. Um, it's just your single Python process that runs in in, in your container. Um, currently, that that basically uh, means Docker. Uh, and, and Kubernetes will just make sure that your application runs somewhere on on one of the machines in the cluster. Um, Machines, uh, Kubernetes uh, refers to machines as nodes in the cluster. Uh, but so, so, so you've got your application, which is your process, um, uh, wrapped in a container, uh, and Kubernetes abstracts that away in, into a pod. Um, a pod is basically has got some extra bells and whistles. For in this talk, you don't really have to worry about um, what, what else you can do with a pod. Uh, pods don't really have much guarantees um, when, they, when they run on, on this cluster. If the node goes away for, for any reason, your pod goes away. Um, but pod, pods may get killed for other reasons because they start using too much resources of some sort or whatever. Um, so so, so they're not, they don't provide any consistency. So the, the next uh, abstraction on top that, that Kubernetes sort of gives is, you, if you, is the replica set. And the replica set kind of monitors your pod. And the idea is there that you should say, um, can I, I? I want to have this many copies. Um, I want to have one or, or, or whatever number of copies of, of my application of, of this application running, uh, and and that will just watch your pod. And if your pod goes away for any reason, you create a new one. And that also allows you to kind of scale up as, as you get more load. You, you add more. Um, you just say, oh, I'll give me more replicas, um, and. M more pods will run, and they'll run distributed over the cluster. There is some uh, sh shadowery involved that, that figures out where the best place is for for, for, for your pods to run. Um, there's other abstractions other than, than replica set, but I'm not going to go into those. Uh, there, there's various other ways of, of looking after your pods, basically. But uh, as concepts for, for now, that's kind of enough to sort of uh, everything is built around it, this this concept, and a, a lot of them use replica sets. Uh, the other thing is like because your pods are so ephemeral, they just move around. They they come and they go. You don't know which machine they're on. You you need to be able to address them. So 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 they are their IP addresses and ports. If you if you have a, a, a service that listens for incoming connections, need to be addressed. So that's where um, this the this service um, abstraction, the service object, comes in, in in with Kubernetes. So the idea there is that it, it's it's basically kind of a, a level four um, proxy. Uh, or, or load balancer, um, and, and, and it just—it's uh, it's fixed IP address, and, uh, um, 
for, for your pod, pod that anyone in the cluster, um, there's a, you, normally a DNS uh, name associated with that as well, so you can easily find it. Uh, and, and whenever you need to talk to, any, uh, to, to, to your service, you, you co connect to that IP address, and that will route the, the, uh, the traffic to wherever the actual pods is. If you have multiple pods, it will round robin between them or something like that. Again, there's more bells and whistles, um, but that's kind of, if you, if you got those, those, those three things, you know enough about, you know, in the basics of, of what Kubernetes kind of, how Kubernetes manages things around. Um, so, brings us to kind of what you can do in, in your execution environment. So you're, you're running in, in your application, your Python program is basically running inside um, this pod that, that's being looked after by replica sets, et cetera. And it basically, it allows you to, to kind of skip uh, a, a, a bunch of boil, boilerplate. You know, your audience is, 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 is an operations team that knows how to handle uh, Kubernetes. Um, and also, it, it means you can rely on, on the architecture for scalability, etc. So you can make your, your, your internal application actually a, a lot simpler. And you don't have to worry about it as much. Um, one of the so the first kind of uh, t thing that I think is, is kind of useful is, is, is don't try and recover errors. Um, if you get an unexpected exception, just make it just make it crash your whole application. It'll probably be fine because you, your application is being, being watched after. Um, so inside Kubernetes, you got a lot, um, uh, all, all the operations is kind of uh, do, done with a lot of YAML files. So, so if you've played Kubernetes before, you might recognize this. This is, a not, this is just a partial kind of uh, view of that. So, so this would be some sort of um, a way, way of defining your application to run. Uh, you have an image and uh, some arguments. It's actually a bit, but the, the, the bit that matters here is the restart policy at the, the very last line. Um, that basically ensures that whenever your application dies, it will get restarted. And that allows you to, you know, when you have any unex unexpected conditions, uh, your, your request data doesn't validate or, 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 or something like that. You can just crash and you can rely on, on, on the infrastructure to, to take care of it. Again, it will be logged uh, the, um, that the crash happened, uh, and, and you, you have all the information to look at uh, what, what went wrong. The one thing if you, if, um, to think about is if you have a service that um, accepts incoming connections uh, and, and processes requests that way, you do have to worry about when you crash what you're going to lose. So if you if you have um, if you have a number of uh, requests queued up inside your application, uh, if you, if you crash and you lose all those requests, they will start timing out. Um, and uh, that that might not be as ideal. So so you may want, you may want to think a little bit about your architecture there, and make sure that um, may, maybe use, use a messaging bus that um, to process your, your your requests, so that when you crash you don't um, you, you don't lose all of those. So you have to look out a little bit for for those. Um, but yeah, otherwise don't don't try and make your your, your application too robust really. And the other thing, kind of linking into that, is, is, is you can you can also make it, your application a lot easier. You, you don't have to handle a lot of scale. The, the idea is to scale via the, the, the process model, which means you just run more processes in parallel. And if you have a, a, a messaging system or, or ready to, to talk between your services, um, it's it's very easy. So, so the um, as I showed earlier in, in, the, in the Kubernetes uh, slide, the idea of scaling is just you create more of your contain more of your pods with your application running into, um, and and that means you not terminating the kind of the end user request. You you should have. Um, uh, a, a load balancer or reverse proxy. If you're handling an HTTP traffic, you know, you'll have a reverse proxy in front of that. So you're not handling directly the end user requests. Um, so so you, you can just, your internal architecture can be very simple. You just have a, a main loop, you handle one request at a time. Uh, you don't, and, and, and making this architecture that way means you don't have to um, w worry about the scale too much because the scaling is done uh, on, on, on a different level, really. Um, yeah, so um, next on, uh, I think it's useful to say 
a little bit about logging. So, uh, again, kind of on a very simple level, if you've if ever played with uh, Docker or Kubernetes, by, by default, things go to standard out. If, you, if you're the main process in, in, in your container, and um, I would recommend to just run one single main process in your container anyways, uh, th then anything you, you, you write to standard out or standard error will, will, will be captured in, in the logs. And th these logs will, will be sent through from Docker to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes will then keep these logs. It's very simple. It works nice while, while developing. Um, but it does have its downsides, because uh, it's its records are basically line based so if you have one line that that's your log message if you if you got a, tra a trace back that you, that you got in your logs you, you that spans multiple lines that's kind of no longer one logical once it's gone through the the, the docker and kubernetes logging that's no longer one logical line um, so um Oftentimes, the, 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 the sort of log aggregation that, that, you, that might be running, um, that you probably, uh, your operations will probably start running on the, once they deal with lots of logs, um, will we'll, we'll try and join back together the, these records into, into, um, into a single record. Uh, but the thing, the thing here is that even though it's, it's just standard out, uh, you want to make it. You want to make sure that it is configurable. Uh, you, it's up to you, depending on how your operations manages things. So if they if they want to send all, all the logs to something like the Elk Stack, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and um, um, Kibana, or something like that. Uh, so so if they want to index it, uh, search it, and make it searchable, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that, that that kind of get, gets built on top, um, but. You still, you still want to give the option to, to the, the op operations to configure their logging. And you, you, so you don't want to bake that completely into your application. Uh, so so it, it's often very, very useful. Um, I prefer it as command line arguments. Um, you, you can stick things into the environment variables as well. Um, but yeah, make sure to sort of um, make, make it configurable so your operation can, can, can choose what they do there. The other thing is like don't skip using using your library uh, using logging libraries because it's because it's just standard out. Um, uh, the logging libraries just to get things going on standard out are very easy to, to set up anyway. It means you straight away get 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 your different log levels that you can use. Um, all, all logging libraries are basically kind of wrappers around the horrible amount of global state that it's quite terrifying. Uh, pick the one you like most, I would say. Uh, some handle the global state in different ways. Um, the thing I'm showing in the in the middle block with uh, with the logbook example is sort of kind uh, kind of leads on to the to the next step that you might want to take with logging is once once you're using a logging library uh, and and your, your your operations have started moving to a log aggregator you might actually want to instead of going via the, the Docker and Kubernetes um, route of letting your logs being captured you might actually want to um, start bypassing and, and start things directly into your to your log aggregation via something like um, uh, gray log or, 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 or system D uh, you, you, you could set that up to, to, to send so you can add your your, your additional logger um, log, log, log handlers to, to your logger library um, and and in that case you probably want to put um, the exception logging right 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 wrapped around your, your main function basically um, because that that will actually allow your whole exception to um, to be sent as one single log record, ra rather than what you, if, if you just let it up to Python to bubble out, it will end up on uh, the normal Python handler will, will print it on standard out again, and it goes back as, as a, a bunch of unrelated records again. Um, the last one, struct log, uh, I think is, is a, a very nice, especially if you're aggregating just lots of things, uh, because it allows you to put a lot more uh, uh, machine passable uh, data in. So it's kind of um, uh, it's, it's kind of a nice uh, wrapper around things as well. Um, the, yeah, so that's that's pretty much everything. Uh, uh, 
the, the around logging, I think. Um, so, so basically, yeah, standard out is, is not amazing, um, but using a log library allows you to evolve towards um, better log record handling. Um, next, next on, I would uh, like to talk about the health endpoints that Kubernetes kind of provides. Um, the the thing the thing here to, that we're trying to address here is is when 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 your application starts up, it might be initializing some data, it might be getting contacting various other things to collect data or whatever. But between process start and and um, being ready to accept connections. Um, this is obviously in the case your, your application is one that receives connections. Th th there is a non-finite time. Um, unfortunately, as soon as your, your application get, starts up, your pod gets created in Kubernetes. It will be, if you have a service pointing to it, um, which you need to accept your connections. Uh, so as soon as, soon as that happens, uh, traffic will start flowing towards you. If you haven't opened your socket yet, um, then those connections are just going to get connection refused. Uh, and and you you're losing your requests basically. So the idea here is that that you tell Kubernetes to to wait to add your pod to the service as one of the one of the handlers of that service until you're actually ready to accept connections. Um, and they do this with a, a readiness probe. Uh, and, and there's various probes, um, various types to, here. Um, the, basically, the three types that, that they support is a TCP socket, H, uh, an HTTP request, and, and a command to execute inside your container itself. Um, the last one is not, not um, always terribly uh, useful, I find. But the first two are, are very useful. So if you have, um, if you're um, for, for the TCP socket example, um, which is the, the top one here. If, if you have, um, if your service basically opens a socket for whatever, maybe zero in queue, gRPC, whatever, something like that, if it directly opens a socket, uh, once the socket is open, basically you, you can use your main listening socket as, as for this probe in this case, because once the socket is open, connections will start to be able to be made. Uh, they'll queue up in the kernel um, until until you call accept on, on, on your socket. So 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 it's a very kind of useful probe. So and in this case, Kubernetes will when you start the pod, it will t try connect try try the port. Um, if it's not ready yet, it will just wait. Um, you can again configure this more more detailed. How often to try and all the sort of things. How long to wait. Um, if, if you if you're having a, a service which which um, handles HTTP, that's um, that, that, that's even simpler. You can just add basically another route to to to, to your um, um, a, API that you got. Uh, it's kind of okay to just um, this health set um, route basically. So uh, this configuration will do a simple plain HTTP request. You you probably find with plain HTTP because, as I said, you have uh, you, your reverse proxy already handling HTTPS, etc. In, in in front of that. Um, and the other thing is because you have your reverse proxy in front, you, you don't have to worry about putting that that health endpoint on on a different port really because your reverse proxy is not going to route any requests to to the end, to that endpoint anyway so users if you are accepting direct user requests users are still not going to see um, that that help and that endpoint because of your reverse proxy so so you can just do that in line with your main request and that gives you a very good um, uh, a, a very good sense of, of when your application is actually really handling your requests um, because there's nothing special anymore um, that kind of brings us to the the next step on that is kind of uh, li liveness uh, uh, checking on this. Uh, it, it's another. The idea uh, here is that uh, uh, if if your if your application hangs or, or something like that, you don't want it to be included in the, um, in in the set of uh, endpoints that serves for that service. Um, this I. This kind of depends on on your application. I mean, oft, oftentimes you shouldn't really just randomly hang because you don't know anything. Um, if you can, you should just crash and raise an exception and crash basically. Uh, but but um, if you do want, uh, it, it's most useful probably if you have an HTTP service. 
uh, or, or, or API or something, because then you can just handle it in line, and that kind of gives you that guarantee of, yes, I'm handling requests in line. Um, the exact example here, I'm not sure. Um, Cat is certainly not a very practical example, um, but it just uh, shows how, how that, that third kind of live um, probe. They're basically the same three pro types of probes that you have for readiness that you can use here as well. Um, the, the one thing to look out with with, with, um, with doing your HTTP requests in line is that that you do you do have to balance it off. Like if your requests are queued uh, and taking a bit too long, so you make you, you have to ch check that your timeouts etc. on your on your liveness probes are okay, because otherwise you might still be handling requests. Uh, but but Kubernetes then decides that you you're taking too long. Um, th there's lots of trade-offs and tuning to be done there. Um, but, so it's kind of, it can be useful, it's, it's a more advanced kind of uh, uh, um, probe or health endpoint uh, to add to it. Um, but it does kind of lead on to um, safe port termination in a way of or container uh, application termination. Uh, because it, it, it is something to kind of think about because uh, Basically, what Kubernetes will do when, when, when you're asked to terminate, so uh, say say a node, the node you're running on is taken to maintenance, so Kubernetes will kind of shut down all the pods on that node. That's not a, that's not a problem for your application because your replica set or something should be making sure that new pods appear somewhere else. But your, your pod is still healthy and and, and servi servicing requests at that point. And so so for a pod that that's or your application that's servicing user requests. Uh, what happens is basically we'll send you sick term. So, and in Python normally you get keyboard interrupt for that. So you will want to re uh, you will want to register a signal handler for it. Uh, so, so, you can, so you can do that gracefully instead of just straight away crashing. Uh, once you sort of in your signal handler you can you can wrap wrap that up uh, more nicely. You can say I'm going to shut down. Um, as soon as you've got sick term, you've basically already been removed from the service, so you're not going to get new requests, but you might still have requests currently queued up. So you want to finish uh, finish your queue uh, that, that, that you're running on. Make sure all your requests are handled so you don't drop any of the requests, and only then um, carry on shutting down. Then the last... Um, the last kind of step into this is kind of um, m monitoring, uh, or, or maybe I think more of it as application instrumentation. So monitoring-wise, there's already a, a bunch of um, kind of monitoring that, that uh, operators can, can do uh, out of the box with, with Kubernetes um, by running stuff like C advisor or something. They'll have an idea of your container and resources it consumes, etc. Prometheus is a, is a different project that is also part of the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, it's, it's quite popular at the moment, but it allows you to basically instrument your, your application in, in various ways. This is a very, very short example, um, basically. Um, its architecture, the, uh, that its monitoring architecture of Prometheus is kind of uh, very, I find it very similar to S, uh, SNMP actually, but just with uh, cu current technologies, um, it, it, it runs um, that, that we currently understand better. So it uses TCP, which is more reliable or, or more, has more guarantees than, than, than UDP. Um, um, and the... Uh, but, but it's still very much an, a, a poll-based kind of the server goes around to all, all instances that it knows and it goes and does a request and gets all the metrics down. Um, the, the, despite it being HTTP, the, the, uh, the, the actual wire format is, is, is quite, uh, quite special. It's either some text format or, or it's um, protocol buffers, I think. Uh, so, so it's easiest to just use a client. Um, they have an official Python client, which um, this is a very primitive example of, uh, so, so it, and it basically comes with, with various kind of uh, instrumentation things, so you can have counts, you can have gauges. Again, if you've ever used SNMP, they're kind of very similar concepts. That, um, so, so, yeah, it, it's just a bunch of metrics and, and they, they can come around and scrape. Uh, in, 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 in this example here, um, ju just using some counters, uh, you, d you define the counters on, on, on the fly, which is um, very convenient. Uh, 
and 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 then you have things like context managers or decorators, etc., to to help you with, with various things. Uh, that's kind of everything about. Um, yeah, that there's a lot more, obviously, that you can do with with, with that instrumentation, um, but that's kind of uh, the the sort of the the next step, I guess. Um, and that's just about time, I think. So thank you very much. I hope that was useful. And if you have any questions.